Healthcare is too expensive. Employers are offsetting costs onto their employees. Who will make health benefits affordable for hardworking Americans and their families? You will. This is the Empowering Plans Podcast, a show dedicated to helping you once again emphasize the benefit in Benefit Plan. Now prepare to learn, plan, save, and protect with the FIA Group. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the FIA Group's podcast, Empowering Plans. This is John Jablon, and with me is my colleague, Jen McCormick. Today, we are here to talk about some interesting issues that are, for lack of a better term, plaguing the self-funded industry. We all know that there's stuff like the No Surprises Act and the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Boy, that's a mouthful. We all know that there are things like that that are creating new challenges and new hurdles for health plans. But a lot of folks have not realized the extent to which that really impacts them and what their role is going to be, in particular TPAs and brokers and, of course, health plans. But there are a lot of obligations floating around today that are creating a lot of confusion in the industry. And so Jen and I want to highlight a few of them and talk a little bit about what everybody's obligations are and the best way that you can prepare for them and spot the issues that are going to be relevant to you. So today we're going to talk about one court case and then three sets of laws. The court case that I'll start with is the Hughes case. I believe we've blogged about this and I personally have written an article about this for Saya's The Self-Insurer publication. So if you haven't seen that, please go check it out. It's a great article if I do say so myself, and of course I do. But the Hughes case is a very, very interesting case. At a high level, it's really about 401k plans. And in particular, this one plan where the fiduciary was alleged to fail to weed out poor investment options. And also the fiduciary provided too many investment options, which caused consumer confusion. Now that term consumer confusion, that's a really interesting term because it of course has lots of meanings and it's very vague and different people can interpret it differently. But at the end of the day, the fiduciary basically gave so many options that plan participants weren't sure which were good, which were bad. They weren't sure exactly what they should or shouldn't be doing. And ultimately they made choices and some of them lost money. And then they sued the fiduciary and said, you never should have given us these bad options. You never should have even let us do that. And it's a great case because the trial court agreed and basically said, yeah, no, there's absolutely no way that the plan can be responsible for choices that the plan participants made. But then the appeals court said, well, actually, we are going to read the fiduciary duties in ERISA to actually mean that the plan has a duty, the fiduciary has a duty to make sure that plan participants are protected from themselves, from making their own poor choices. Now, of course, there are some nuances, but ultimately we're looking at this as a way to try to extrapolate this to the self-funded world, or at least try to anticipate how courts might do that. And in the 401k universe, it kind of scares me that plans are maybe being faulted for offering too many options or you know, confusing options or options where participants can make the choice and ultimately make certain choices that cost them more money for essentially the same results. Because when I look at this, the first thing, maybe the most obvious example that comes to mind is choice of medical providers, right? If people have the choice of different medical providers to visit in an ordinary health plan, and of course, providers charge more or less than other providers, then those people are going to get basically the same services, but they're going to be charged a heck of a lot more or less by certain providers. So my concern is that fiduciaries are eventually going to be liable for offering too many choices and giving people the ability to be charged more. And that scares the heck out of me, to be honest. Yeah. And you know what? One of the things to keep in mind here, too, I know that we're talking about this in the context of the 401k space, but we are talking about fiduciary duties, which are outlines under the ERISA regulations. And those rules, whether you're a 401k plan or a health and pension plan, those duties are the same. And historically, we have seen a lot of fiduciary breach cases in the 401k space. We're talking about pensions and retirement plans and how there was the mismanagement of assets issue. But it really gets down to that key issue about what and how it is that you have to prudently manage those assets. What is your obligation as a fiduciary to look out and protect the plan participants? And it's interesting that only now, at this point, we're really connecting this to the health and welfare space and seeing how this potentially is a warning or maybe it's meant to be some sort of advance notice 
this is something that you need to pay attention to in the health space as well, since these are obligations that you have, like you mentioned, for the plan participants to make sure that with all of these options they have available to them, what is your role in making sure that they are selecting the appropriate choice for them, that you are protecting them while also protecting the plan as a whole? And this isn't something that we have yet to see a specific case in the health space about, but I really do think that this is something that should be taken seriously. And we look to say, as a fiduciary, as a plan administrator, pulling maybe from other 401k cases that we've seen in the past, and are there other obligations that we need to make sure that we are aware of and fulfilling in our capacity as a plan administrator for a fiduciary? Yeah, well said, Jen. And the, the last thing I want to bring up on this topic is the interplay between a plan and its TPA. Right, because we look at this and the plan fiduciary was held responsible, but ultimately we all know that TPAs have a huge role in the direction of the plan. And often plans rely on their TPAs for things like drafting a plan. You know, and the law likes to think that health plans, the plan sponsors draft the plan, but I would venture that most people listening here know that the TPA and often even the broker have huge, huge parts in that. So the question of who can be or who will be faulted for certain things, well, that's anybody's guess. You know, and we've historically thought of the 401k line of cases and law as parallel to the health side, but we're seeing an increase in instances where that is not the case. Because of course, ERISA applies to both, and it's only a matter of time until the courts and the regulators start extrapolating the 401k laws that make a lot of sense in that space, or don't, I guess, as this case to me at least says, to the health side. And we're all in some unexpected positions there. So thanks, Jen. And let's move on to the three laws. The CAA is the first one, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which of course includes the No Surprises Act, but we're going to talk about those separately. So we've got the CAA, the NSA, which is the No Surprises Act. And then the last law we're going to talk about today is the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, colloquially known as Mental Health Parity, just because the MHPAEA is a heck of a mouthful. So with respect to the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the CAA, the main thing here that's causing some ripples is the requirement for fee disclosures. Now, there's a common misconception that these are just for brokers because most of the articles and materials that talk about them refer to them as broker compensation laws. But really, it applies to TPAs, consultants, brokers, basically anyone that provides services for a health plan. And of course, that pool is a fairly large one, right? It's not just brokers. That would be extreme folly to think that it is just brokers. So if you provide services to a health plan in any capacity and you receive fees because nobody works for free, there's a very good chance that you fall under this law as well. That being said, the law is not terribly daunting. The law does not impose any restrictions on fees. It just says that you have to disclose what those fees are. Basically, plans need a way to evaluate whether or not fees are reasonable. They can make decisions for themselves, but plans are no longer going to be given very vague descriptions of fees, such as, you know, we may charge an additional fee for X, Y, Z. Well, there's no way for the plan to reasonably decide whether that fee is reasonable because it's just a fee and that doesn't actually say anything. So we see a lot of that, especially in ASAs. And of course, it's not anybody trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, right? It's really just... A lot of TPAs, they just don't know what the fees are going to be, right? I mean, a very common ASA provision is we reserve the right to charge an additional fee for claims requiring, you know, special handling or really complex claims. Well, sure, that makes perfect sense. And of course, a TPA needs the right to charge additional fees. But this CAA, this new compensation disclosure law, it doesn't really allow TPAs to just say we might charge you more. You have to explain either what you're going to charge or at least describe how you might figure that charge out. And it also applies to back-end fees, even if they're not coming directly from the plan. Any money you're getting, let's say, on behalf of someone working for the plan, any money coming even indirectly from the plan, you've still got to disclose it. Basically, the plan needs to know where its fees are going, and it needs to be able to decide whether they are reasonable. Yeah, and you know, John, I think that's a great segue, too, is... With the CAA, particularly when we're talking about the disclosure rules, the issue is we want to know why this fee was being charged so that we can determine and decide whether or not the fee itself was reasonable, which brings us to one of our favorite topics these days, which is the No Surprises Act or the NSA. 
And as we're talking through this particular regulation and these rules, there are lots of implications, not only for the TPA in this space or the plan in this space or for any of those service providers that are involved in the administration or the day-to-day -day operations of the plan. There are a lot of things for us to unpack. And also when this approach, this yes is in effect as of 1-1-2022, but this is a rolling and an ongoing basis. So not only are we trying to figure out what obligations with the No Surprises Act that we have as a plan to make sure that we are aware of those, but we're really trying to figure out what our role is in comparison to everybody else who's involved which makes this pretty complicated for us to really try and unpack what my role is, what my obligation is as a plan sponsor or as a fiduciary versus what my administrator's role as a TPA. And unfortunately, it seems like there are obligations for everybody who is involved in this process. But since this rule came into effect, it's very rare that we see outlined within the administrative services agreement or any other documentation, who is responsible for what particular role. So that leaves us with this big gap and lots of obligations to fulfill, and we're unclear about who needs to fulfill them, which leaves us with the opportunity to make lots of assumptions and then leave a lot of people out of compliance. And I think this is going to be a continuing problem unless now we really see and realize that as the fiduciary, as the plan sponsor, the NSA impacts me and I am responsible for making sure that all of these obligations, whether it is record keeping or how a claim is being processed or modifying my plan language to accommodate all of these rules, those are things that I have an affirmative duty to make sure that I can fulfill or at least have the conversations to make sure that this is in the works. Absolutely, Jen. And I think that that applies really to sort of everything we're talking about today and maybe even on a larger scale to everything, period. I mean, plans and TPAs need to be on the same page about who is handling what, who is required to handle what, and how these things are being handled. And I think that the No Surprises Act gives us a fantastic example of some people not quite being on the same page. And, you know, we're not going to go into the specifics of the No Surprises Act on this podcast. I think we've probably done that on more podcasts than I care to count at this point already. And look, if you're not familiar with the NSA's requirements, I'm not going to say I blame you. They are a lot. They're convoluted. But if you're not, you should try to get familiar with them. And the FIA group has a lot of resources for that, as do you know so many other companies. So just do yourself a favor. And if you're not familiar with it, Google No Surprises Act and just start reading and fall into that rabbit hole, which we've all done so far. So yeah, there's a lot of issues regarding administrative services agreement language compared to the industry perception of what's going on or what should be going on. And a lot of folks are somehow under the impression that a lot of the No Surprises Act regulations and laws are actually TPA requirements. But really, that's not the case. They're plan requirements that plans will expect their TPAs to help comply with or to just undertake on their own. And that can cause a real problem when the TPA has not promised to do it, but the plan expects the TPA to do it. So let's move on to the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, or like I said before, just mental health parity. It's just easier to say. So about the mental health parity, I think the component here of that has been a new challenge for groups and administrators and brokers and employers is that they have been tasked with putting something in place, a documentation component to prove and to show that for all of these years that they've been in compliance with mental health parity, that they can actually have substantiated data, evidence, standards, and protocols to back up the way that they have been operating. And that has been quite a challenge because unfortunately, a lot of this information is not readily available. And even upon request, it's something that plans and administrators and brokers are getting a ton of pushback when they're asking for information that they have an obligation to show to the DOL whenever requested. I think this is gonna be quite a challenge for plans. Yeah, and it's especially interesting because we've gotten asked a lot by individual plants and brokers, can we just do this ourselves? You know, maybe our TPA or some vendors are not cooperating. Can we do it ourselves? And our answer is generally, well, not really. I mean, anyone can look at plan language, right? And sort of make a decision of whether or not it seems to comply with the mental health parity law. But 
really the DOL or the Department of Labor rather has said that the analysis has to be far more in depth than just looking at language. There has to be what they're calling an operational analysis. You need to look at data, not necessarily, you know, PHI, no specific claims data, but aggregated data. And if you can't get that from a vendor, that's a real problem. And you know, a bigger problem is when you can't get it from your own TPA. And we've actually seen some of that out there where the TPA basically says either we don't have the data or we're not going to provide this data. And, you know, we can't help but wonder, well, <laughs> why the heck not? <laughs> you know, how is the plan supposed to comply with its legal obligation if its own TPA won't even help? So, you know, it's really a shame when that happens and there's very, very little actual recourse, right? Because the DOL has said that it wants plans to name names. Basically, the DOL said, look, if a vendor, whether it's a TPA or medical management or whoever else, if there's a vendor that is uncooperative, put their name in the analysis. Do your analysis, right? Don't just not do the analysis because you didn't get the data, but make sure you do your mental health parity NQTL analysis and just say, hey, so-and-so vendor, we asked them for help numerous times on these dates. And you know, here are copies of the emails, here are the questions we asked, and here are their responses where they refused to help over and over and over. I'm not sure what the DOL might do in the future, but there has been a little bit of guidance that maybe sort of suggests that they might look into it and you know, maybe give some vendors a, a stern talking to or whatever the DOL might be empowered to do. But basically the fact that you're unable to get data as a health plan does not mean that you're excused from performing the analysis. It just means that your analysis is probably not going to be sufficient, which is truly a real shame, but you know, getting data is a huge part of it. And if you can't get the data, then you can't complete the analysis. So whatever your relationships are with your vendors, just know that you're gonna need help, right? Compiling this data, even for just a TPA, there's always going to be a data set that you need to rely on someone else to get. So just be prepared to try to get information and check the ASA to see if the TPA has or wants to assume any responsibilities related to this. And of course, you know, we recommend having an expert perform this analysis because yes, technically anybody can do it with the right data and the right analysis, but getting the right data and doing the right analysis, it is very, very difficult. So, you know, whatever duties the TPA has assumed, fantastic, but just know that this is not something that TPAs will automatically do no matter what. Yeah, and you know, as we wrap up here, John, the last note I'll share about the mental health parity NQTL requirements is that in the recent DOL report that was issued, they noted that this was an ongoing and continuing problem, that there was a lack of collaboration and coordination between the various entities. And it was the recommendation to Congress that they actually amend and modify ERISA so there is the direct ability for the DOL and EBSA to go after those entities who are standing in the way of being able to perform the obligations under ERISA. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what sort of recommendations we'll see and what sort of changes and modifications to ERISA potentially might happen in the future. But with all these examples and these regulations in this case that we've discussed, it really is showing a trend and a common theme about the importance and the significance of your obligation as a fiduciary. And it's one that needs to be taken seriously. Thanks so much, Jen. All excellent points. This has been John Jablon and Jen McCormick. Thank you so much for tuning in to Empowering Plans. We will talk to you soon.